Amen. Good morning. Good to see you all. A couple of visitors with us this morning. Wonderful to have you with us, guest visitors. Welcome to, uh, welcome to church. And uh, if you have your Bible on you, please grab it and turn to Revelation, last book in the Scriptures, Genesis to Revelation, all God's Word, all profitable for us, the words of life. And we're continuing in this series in the seven churches in Asia. And by way of introduction, I had the privilege, the joy of heading down um, south this week, Monday through Wednesday, with a Calvary pastor's get-together. We had seven of the Calvaries here in New Zealand represented, and it was a really great time of, of, of catching up with one another, um, sharing what's going on in our lives and the life of the churches, uh, praying for each other. I won't lie to you, there was quite a lot of eating that went on. It was a lot of fun. And a little bit of laughing. We've got a, we've got a snapshot of a bit of laughing here. It was uh, while a photograph was being taken. That's the crew there. My hair is... Um, my hair's gone rogue there. But this is the bunch of guys. And the reason I mention it is, you know, the bunch of dudes are, are, are different, different people. You've got some that are older... Um, some that are younger, some that are farmers, some that are not. I'll, I'll let you guess which one there. He has a white beard, um, is the farmer among us. Some are born in New Zealand, others born abroad, married, single, kids, no kids. Some have beards, others have uh, no beards. We'll take that photo down now. But also different churches, as we were sharing with one another. You know, one of the cool things about when we get together is I always ask the other guys, what book are you in? You know, Whangarei, they're in uh, Exodus at the moment, uh, Auckland, they're in Acts, Hamilton, they're in Second Chronicles, Tauranga, they're in Philippians, no, Matthew, Christchurch, they're in, in Philippians, we're of course in this mini-series at the moment. So we're always in the Scriptures, but you know, as I look at the churches, some are much larger. Auckland, it's a decent-sized church up there. 200, 250 people or so. Some that are much smaller, church plants that are pretty tiny, still, still growing. Some churches that are very, a very mature body. Others are a lot of newer believers. Some that have very established leadership teams. Others are in need of leaders in the church. Some have their own buildings. Some rent a building permanently, got permanent use of it. Others like us, a pop-up church on a, on a Sunday morning. Um, some are financially solid, other, others have definite financial needs. Some have a great and sweet unity in the body, and, and some, particularly with the COVID stuff the last couple of years, there's been a degree of fracture in a couple of the churches over some of those things. Some churches are wrestling or have different theological issues that they're working through with folks in their church. And as I look at this church, you know, I'm reminded as we, as we consider the second church this morning in Asia, they were geographically proximate, right? They're all in this area known as, as, as Asia, relatively close, but they were facing these very diverse issues, a lot of stuff going on. We saw last week the first church, the church at Ephesus, right? They were a well-taught, they were a mature church. Jesus had a lot to commend them for, but there was that one key thing that they were lacking in, which was, was love. They'd become a, a cold church. Well, this morning we're looking at a, a second church, the church at Smyrna. And just up the road, not too far, they were suffering, and they would suffer a whole lot more. This church, Jesus had the least to say to them, verse-wise, but there is a lot in there. So join with me, stand, and we'll read these verses together. I'll do the even, you do the odd. Revelation 2, verse 8. Jesus says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, 
and I will give you the crown of life. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for those passages which bring us great comfort. We thank you also, Lord, for those passages of Scripture that in some ways are quite confronting. We have one of them this morning. We pray that as Jesus, you see, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. Father, we do pray that by your Holy Spirit that you would speak to us, that you would move in our hearts, that you would prepare our hearts, Lord, that you would do a work among us. And Father, as we've been praying, that we could live out the things that we read and we speak about today. And everyone who agreed said, Amen. 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 Please take a seat as we look at our five C's that we've been looking at with each of these churches. The first, of course, is church. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right, Smyrna means bitterness or to mix with myrrh. Smyrna, Myrna, Smyr, Smyr, Myr, Smurf, Myr. <laughs> Myr came from a tree resin. And interestingly, if you went to that tree or went to that bush and you took a whiff of that resin, you wouldn't smell anything. But if you crushed the resin, if you pounded it, then it would release this beautiful beautiful fragrance to you. Myrrh, of course, was given to the baby Jesus when he was born, one of the gifts from the wise men, gold, frankincense, and and myrrh. Also, when Jesus was on the cross, the Roman soldiers went to give him wine mixed with myrrh as a um, relief of the pain. He wouldn't take it. And then after his death, one of the things they came to anoint his body with was, was myrrh. Myrrh speaks of Christ's sufferings and it speaks of his, his death. He tasted death for us, died on that cross for us. And the church of Smyrna is appropriately named as they were suffering this crushing persecution for their faith, for their belief in the Lord Jesus. If we can put up our trusty map here, Smyrna was some 35 miles to the north of Ephesus on the Aegean Sea, and it was a proud city that claimed to be, it called itself the glory of Asia, or the ornament of of Asia. It was situated on a small harbour, Ephesus on a large harbour, Smyrna on a smaller harbour, and it was well connected there to the interior of Asia. Different trade routes went off from it. We might think of it as, as a boutique city, smaller city, boutique and, and beautiful. It was a commercial center, and as the name might suggest, myrrh was its primary export, its primary product that it sent abroad, this precious perfume, this precious ointment. It was also a cultural center. It was known for its schools of philosophy, schools of rhetoric. And interestingly, the famous Greek poet Bard Homer, who wrote the Iliad, the Odyssey, he was born in in Smyrna. It was also a religious center. And important for us as as we consider these verses this morning, understand the cultural, the religious context in which the church in Smyrna was planted. There was this kind of trifecta of spiritual darkness that they were dealing with. The first was to do with the the Greek or the Roman gods. If you disembarked your boat as you arrived in the port at Smyrna, one of the first streets you'd be confronted with was called the, the Golden Street. Didn't have golden pavement like there will be in heaven, but there was a lot of gold in the shops and different things along the street. But as you went along the street, you would see up above the city, what was referred to as the crown of Smyrna, which was this hill which had a number of temples on it, temples to Apollos, temples to Sybil, the supposed mother of the gods, temple to Zeus. These deities were there at large looking down over over the city. But interestingly, at that time, the, 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 the Greek, the Roman gods were kind of going out of fashion. 
And what was more trendy, what was on the rise, was the second area of spiritual darkness. Smyrna was famous, it was known for its emperor worship. Emperor worship, the cult of Caesar worship was on the rise. What is that, you may ask? Well, worshipping the Caesar, the emperor, as, as a god. In fact, in 23 AD, you know how when the Olympics or the, maybe the Football World Cup, different cities compete to host the rights of it, right? Football World Cup later on in Qatar. Go figure, right? <laughs> they're playing at 10 p.m. at night to deal with the heat or something like, something like that. But they won the rights over other cities to host the Football World Cup, and so it is with the Olympics and the like. Well, Smyrna in 23 AD, they won the rights or they, they won the privilege over 11 other cities to have a temple to Tiberius, Tiberius Caesar. And by the end of the first century, as the book of Revelation was being written, Worshipping Caesar as Lord had become compulsory throughout the empire. The third prong of this spiritual darkness, this trifecta, there was a large Jewish population in Smyrna and a number of synagogues throughout the city, and there was great hostility from the Jews to the, to the Christians, Jew and Gentile, but the ethnic Jews were very hostile to the believers in Jesus. And so we have our second C, Christ. And look there, verse 8, as we read, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Jesus refers to himself, as we saw back in chapter 1, as the first and the last. And this speaks of Christ's eternal nature, Back in verse 8 of chapter 1, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, right? The A and the, and the Z, the Aleph and the, and the Taf. The church at Smyrna needed to be reminded that they serve the eternal God and to keep the eternal perspective in, in mind. He says, who was dead and came to life, literally who became dead and lived again. Why did Christ die? We know this, don't we? 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel, Jesus died for your sins. He was buried and on the third day he rose again. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you need to know that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He was perfect, you are not perfect. He is sinless, you are not sinless. He died for your sins was buried in the good news, he rose again, conquering, conquering death. But for this church at Smyrna, as they were suffering for Christ, as they were facing tribulation for Christ, and in fact, some of them would die for Christ, the church are reminded by Christ that he also suffered. He was mocked, he was beaten, he was whipped, he was nailed to that cross. He died. And we, of course, as followers of Jesus, right, take up your cross and follow Him. He reminds these people who were suffering for Him that He knew what it was to suffer, and He also died. But they're reminded wonderfully that they served a risen Lord, that He was dead, and He was now alive. He was dead, but He now lives. So the church is also reminded that death is not, death is not the end. Death does not have the last word for the believer. Eternal life awaits those who trust in Christ. Then we see third, the commendation, verses 9 through 10. Again, Jesus says, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation. Ten days be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Twice in these verses, Jesus says, I know. I know your works. I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. And I love this, a great reminder for us again that Jesus knows, right? He has his finger on the pulse of what's going on in your life. Whatever you're going through today, Jesus knows. 
But he knows what's going on in the life of that church. He knows what's going on in the life of this church. Jesus knows what's going on in the culture, right? We're trying to figure out where are things headed and what's going to go? What's the direction of travel? Jesus knows. He knows where the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age is at. He knows also, interestingly, he knows what the enemy is up to. But he says there, I know your works. And understand in this hard spiritual environment, he said the same thing to the church at Ephesus, right? I know your works. But to this church in Smyrna who was suffering, he says, I know. And he commends them for their good works, the things that they were doing in the service of him. They were an active, they were a busy body in a good way. He says, I know your tribulation, flipsis in Greek. It's quite a fun word to say, flipsis. It means affliction, your distress, your suffering. Literally means your pressure. I know your pressure. And he's not speaking here of everyday tribulations, right? Trying to watch the rugby and the internet connection isn't working, right? Why? Stubbing your toe as you walk out the back door. No, he's not talking about that. He's not talking about even momentary testing, right? You're with a bunch of friends and they're tempting you, pressuring you to go and do this or that, and you know it's not right, and you say, oh, actually, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm a Christian. He's not talking about that. What he's talking about is a grinding, constant pressure, a constant pressure of persecution, like a stone that's grinding wheat or the olive press, pressing the olives until the oil comes out, or like the crushing of, of myrrh for that fragrance to come. I know your tribulation, I know your pressure, Jesus says. And again, the Smyrnans were suffering big time. They were in the midst of it, and it wasn't over yet. Jesus knows when Christians are suffering, when His people are suffering around the world, He knows their suffering is not hidden from them, and He's not indifferent. He's not afar off. He's right there with them. He says, I know your works, I know your tribulation, and he says, and I know your poverty, but you are rich. There's different words for poverty, and this word here means like abject poverty, the poorest of the poor. But notice Jesus' perspective on this church, right? They lived in this prosperous city, boutique, prosperous city, and they were dirt poor barely making ends meet. Even that word has the idea of being reduced to begging. And understand, the poverty that they were experiencing was connected with the persecution that they were experiencing. If they weren't Christians, they wouldn't be in the state that they were materially. Why was that? If you were a Jew who converted to Christianity, you would become a persona non grata to the Jewish community, an outcast from the synagogue. They wouldn't buy from you. They wouldn't sell to you. If maybe you'd become a a believer out of a Gentile, pagan society, they'd have these guilds, these work guilds, often connected with different religious practices, but you'd be excluded from from the guild. You couldn't practice your trade. And the Romans, they could confiscate your property if they so desired. But it's interesting, you know, today, and we can sometimes fall into this trap, right? Many associate physical success with with spiritual success. And you think about it, right? You you see a, a large church with a big building and the lights are always on, right? They've got a big budget, they've got a pastor, a large pastoral staff, they've got some big ministries going on. And again, nothing wrong with all of those things, but you can associate it with these things equal big success. Look a little bit ahead to Revelation 3 verse 17, right? Another spoiler alert this morning. These words from Jesus to the church at Laodicea. Because you say, 
I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked, right? They thought that they were rich. They thought that they were doing good. And Jesus says, really, you're poor spiritually. And I wonder for the church at Smyrna, maybe it came as a bit of a surprise to them that Jesus said to them, I know your poverty, but you guys are rich. How is it? How is it they were rich? Physically poor, but spiritually rich. Look at this verse from James chapter 2. Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Beautiful verse. Another one, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18. And this was actually written to the rich. He says, let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. You know, for us this morning, regardless of your physical prosperity or not. You can be rich in grace. You can be rich in faith. You can be rich in good works. You can be rich towards God. And when you think about it, right, we who, whose sins are forgiven, who are on our way to heaven, are we not the richest people in the world? The world doesn't see it. They don't know it. But if your sins are forgiven, man, you are rich in Christ. Ephesians tells us, speaks of that inheritance that is awaiting for us. He says also, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. That's like a throwdown, right? That's fighting words right there. But this is Jesus saying that. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. And again, Christians living in this pagan, idolatrous city, they were surely suffering at the hands of the Gentiles, and they were. But not only that, they were also suffering at the hands of Jews who would spitefully target and mistreat them. You know, in the book of Acts, Jesus, of course, Jewish, the Apostles, all Jewish. The early churches, preaching in the synagogues, and there'd be, a, you know, a lot of the churches, a large Jewish population within the church. Christianity spread, first the Jew, first in the Gentile. But you look at the book of Acts also, there was a lot of hostility that came from the synagogues towards the Christians, right? Rejection of those believers that came out of Judaism, converted to Christianity. So understand here, when he refers to these who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan, he's not talking about Judaizers. He's not talking about, you know, these Jewish legalists that were infiltrating the church and trying to, you know, convert the Christians into sort of the law of Moses. No, he's speaking about, you know, ethnic Jews, part of the synagogue. They want nothing to do with Christianity. They're Jews by birth, say they are Jews and are not, but they were not Jews by second birth. They were still in darkness. The true Jew, the spiritual Jew, we read in Romans 2, verses 28 and 29, speaks there that it's not about the outward circumcision. It's not about this outward act. It's about the inner circumcision of the the heart. Being born of God's Spirit. Being a new creation in Christ. And you know, for us as a church that understands God's prophetic purposes for the Jews, for national Israel, those purposes are found in Christ. God's purposes for the Jewish people are found in the Lord Jesus. Right back, chapter 1, verse 7, where it refers to, they'll look upon him whom they pierced, Zechariah chapter 12. Something very cool, uh, April 2024, mark it on your calendar, still almost two years away, but one of the things we're looking to do, Calvary, New Zealand, um, is to have a trip to Israel. And um, I hope that maybe some from this church will start saving your pennies along with me and uh, head along there. But something really cool that we're looking to do, excited about. But in Jesus' day, you recall, he rebuked the Pharisees where they 
called him names and attacked his parentage. And they questioned, they rejected the father-son relationship. Who is your father? They said to him. And they were very proud that they were descendants of Abraham. But Jesus said to them in John 8, 44, that they were of their father, the devil. And here Jesus refers to as a synagogue of Satan. You know, in our day, a many point, you know, some Christians esteem all things Jewish. If it's Jewish, it can sort of be in their minds that it must be, you know, inherently, inherently good. And they highly regard Judaism. And understand, Christianity, of course, comes out of Judaism in one sense. It's, it's the true fulfillment of it, right? Christianity, the fulfillment of the prophetic scriptures. And it sounds harsh to say, but Judaism today, and actually in Jesus' day, as Revelation was being written, it's an antichrist and satanic religion. It's a works-based religion, one which rejects Christ, says he's not the Son of God. It is inherently anti-God. And you also look at particularly Judaism today, this mystical Kabbalah element to it that is, in my view, patently demonic in nature. We go on and we read in verse 10, and this is a confronting verse, in my view. Jesus says, do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. We sometimes speak of a person having a saviour complex. Maybe you've heard that phrase, or a white knight syndrome. When someone is suffering or someone is struggling, they see it as their solemn duty to go and stop that person from suffering. I must go, I must help. They're in pain, they're suffering. I need to be the one that goes and fixes the problem, fixes the situation. They would be a saviour, so to speak, to them. Here we have the Saviour speaking to His church about their suffering and their tribulation. And it's kind of confronting to me. Notice what He does not say to them. He doesn't say to them, guys, rescue is imminent. Rescue is on its way. He doesn't say, we've got this special op underway. He's not in the control room dispatching an angelic army and saying they're en route, right? Ten, nine, eight, incoming, right? Brace for the ladder to come down and hoik you on out of there. No, he doesn't say that. What does he say to them? He says to them, do not fear. You will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. Sometimes our ideas of what is best for us and what God should do doesn't align with what God sees as best for us and what God does do. He says, do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. You're going to suffer. Do not fear. And at this point, they were experiencing this poverty. And they were experiencing, as it says, this, this, this blasphemy. But what's about to happen, some of them are going to be thrown into prison, and some of them are even going to die. But he doesn't save them from that suffering. Rather, he strengthens them in anticipation of it. As we said a number of times during First and Second Peter, to be forewarned, to be forewarned is to be forewarned armed. Jesus says to them, hey guys, this is happening. This is going to happen. Get ready. Literally, stop being afraid. They were afraid. He says, stop being afraid. And you know, for us, if and when real persecution does come, and it may do, Jesus' word to his church, do not fear. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. 
And this tells us the origin of the persecution, the tribulation that was coming their way. The devil was behind it. The devil was orchestrating it. At times, we know Satan comes as a snake to deceive, and other times he just goes guns blazing, full-on attack. He comes as a lion, which is what's happening here. But again, Jesus, Jesus knows. Jesus knows of Satan's plans. He knows what the devil is about to do. We're going to finish with this today, but you know what's the worst that the devil can do? Kill the body. But Jesus has defeated death. He's the one who was dead and who lives. Defeated death, defeated the devil. He says that you may be tested. That word tested can also be translated tempted or tried or proved. And it's interesting, the same test that the devil intends to shipwreck your faith, to cause you to abandon your faith, to give up on Christ and say, this is not what I signed up for. That very same test, and here, it was coming from Satan, but that same test, God has His purposes, that He would prove your faith, that He would refine your faith, that He would establish you and mature you and make you more like Christ. And again, as I say, sometimes we have this idea of what God is doing or what God should do, what the objective is. God's main objective, His primary goal for you is to fit you for heaven, to mature you, to bring you further down that sanctification process. And we don't like to hear it, but suffering as a killer means, excuse the pun, <laughs> to achieve that goal. God's greatest goal for you is not your happiness, but your, your holiness. Not your comfort, but that you would be complete in Him. His primary goal is not that you would have fun. God's not against fun. He created fun. <laughs> but His main desire, His main goal for you is that you would be fruitful as a Christian, that you'd bear fruit for His glory. He says also, and you will have tribulation 10 days. There's debate, debate among scholars, commentators, pastors on this, and oftentimes the plain meaning is the preferred meaning. You will have tribulation 10 days. There's a severe persecution that was coming their way. And even if it was 10 days, right, 10, 24-hour periods, you look in Nazi Germany, a lot can be done in 10 days. A lot can be done in one day, one bad day. But it's kind of neat to note there also that even though this persecution is coming and it was of the devil, that it was time-bound. It was limited. It's 10 days, Jesus says. But another perspective is perhaps this was speaking of 10 years, maybe speaking prophetically of a specific period of persecution under one of the Caesars, or another interesting interpretation, and one that I'm comfortable with is I think it's borne out in history, 10 waves of persecution under 10 different emperors. Many point to this beginning with, the, with Emperor Nero in 54 AD, and the tenth, the final period of persecution under Diocletian in 284 AD. And one of the lenses we've been looking at this series with is, is this panorama of church history, right? That each of these churches kind of speaks to a different period in church history as we go along. Last week, the church at Ephesus, the early church, that by the end of the first century, they were still solid in their works and their labor and their doctrine, but their love for Jesus had, been, had grown cold and they needed to repent of that. The love that was there in the first days, the early days of the church had kind of gone cold. Well, here we have our second church speaking to this period of time in the second and third century, specifically around 100 AD to 312 AD with Constantine coming in. But there really was 200 plus years of these waves of persecution that came upon the church. 
It's estimated that some 6 million Christians died during this, during this period. And so here we have Smyrna, and they, they typify, kind of represents the persecuted church writ large during that, during that period. Smyrna is the micro, but they're representing the macro, the bigger picture of persecution that would go on in the empire during, during this 200-year period. And particularly with it was the prevalence of emperor worship. One commentator, William Barclay, says this, have a listen, emperor worship had begun as a spontaneous demonstration of gratitude to Rome, right? Little flags, yay Rome, we're going to worship the emperor. But towards the end of the first century, in the days of Domitian, the final step was taken and Caesar worship became compulsory. Once a year, the Roman citizen must burn a pinch of incense on the altar to the godhead of Caesar. And having done so, this is interesting, he was given a certificate to guarantee that he had performed his religious duty. Remember in primary school, you get a certificate for, you know, crossing your arms and folding your legs. I don't know, maybe they still do. A couple of stickers on there. You got a certificate for doing your religious duty. And all that the Christians had to do, Barclay says, was burn that pinch of incense, say Caesar is Lord, receive their certificate, and go away and worship as they pleased. But that is precisely what the Christians would not do. They would give no man the name of Lord. That name they would keep for Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. They would not conform. And understand with this that it started, well, it was gradual. It started spontaneously, right? The people, some people wanted to do it. And then they would establish these temples to dead emperors. But then the next step was they made temples to living emperors. The guy that's there in Rome in power, this was a temple to him. It began as voluntary and then it became compulsory. And talk about pressure. There was the social pressure that was gradual also. Some of you are joining some dots in your mind here. But it started kind of innocently, we might say. Not innocently, it's idolatry, but it started innocently. But then it became this thing of like civic duty. Some of you work in the corporate world. Be a good corporate citizen. Do your part. And then if you were a good citizen of Rome, this is what you would do. It was a test of your fealty, your loyalty. Remember Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Worship me and all the kingdoms of the world will be yours. Satan tempting these Christians. Just one pinch of salt and you can go on your merry way. And understand, the Romans, they were fine with you worshipping who you wanted to worship. Worship in the synagogue, worship whatever just as long as you did that pinch of salt, pinch of incense, said Caesar is Lord, you didn't even have to say it with enthusiasm, just sort of mutter it under your breath. You were good to go. You could worship whoever and whatever you were worshipping before. And you think of our day, right? Just post that thing on social media. Post that picture. Write those words. Sign that policy. Use your left hand if you want, kind of squiggly if you're right-handed. Wear that badge. Wear that lanyard. I only learned the lanyard, the word lanyard a few years ago. I was like, what is this thing? I don't know what it is, but it's around my neck and it's called a lanyard. There you go. Do that gesture. Say the words. Take a knee. Show your allegiance. Show your true colours. And a good question for us, what would you do if you were faced with that kind of social, religious pressure? What would you do? Bow the knee to Caesar or be faithful to Christ and suffer the consequences? 
We know, of course, the scriptures speak about the last days, a revived Roman Empire. The mark of the beast connected with worship, also connected with participation in the economic system. You want to buy, you want to sell, take the mark. You don't, face death. Be faithful unto death, Jesus says, and I will give you the crown of life. The martyrs would receive the Stephanos, victor's crown. And again, interestingly, the believers in Smyrna, they lived under the, what was known as the crown of Smyrna, the hill with its different temples on it. But Jesus promised them their own crown. Be faithful unto death, I will give you the crown of life. One famous Smyrna martyr, was a man, bishop, pastor, Polycarp. Kind of a fishy sounding name, but this guy Polycarp was, he was a disciple of John and he was killed in 155 AD. Originally, his congregation, as this persecution arose, at a particular point, his congregation said, John, get out of the city, go find somewhere safe. Once it's passed over, you come, you come back. All good. So he does that, and then one day as he's, as he's praying, he has this vision of his pillow just engulfed with flame, and he knew that the Lord was speaking to him, saying that it was his time to die for Christ. The authorities soon arrested him, and he was an ancient, he was an old man at this point, and he was taken to Smyrna's stadium. There was a crowd of people there. And the officials tried to persuade him to simply offer that pinch of incense to Caesar, say the word, Caesar is Lord. And his response, I love this, for 86 years I have served Jesus, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who has saved me? They threatened him with the wild beasts. They threatened him to to burn him at the stake if he did not recant. If he did not repent, they said, called him an atheist for not worshipping their gods. But he said to them, you threaten me with fire, which burns for an hour and is soon extinguished, but the fire of future judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly, you are ignorant of. They tried to burn him. Fox's Book of Martyrs tells us that instead of him burning kind of like the sails billowing out the fire, kind of billowed out from around him, and it became really a a wall of fire protecting him. So they ran him through with a sword, and he died that way. He was faithful unto death, and as his reward received that crown of of life. Our fourth C this morning, I realise it might be going a little bit longer than usual, but the fourth C, and this is one to note with the persecuted church, There is no correction. Jesus had no word of correction, no word of criticism for them. Nothing. Persecution has a way of purifying God's people. Separates the wheat from the chaff. Either you're all in or you're out. And interestingly, there's only two churches that were really had no need of correction, but only one church of the seven is still found today, which is the church at Smyrna. Withstood Roman, Muslim persecution, Smyrna is Izmir in Turkey today. That church was crushed by suffering, but they're faithful faithful to God and a sweet smell to, to him. We know this, but the persecuted church, of course, exists in the world today, doesn't it? Um, Largely, we look at parts of northern Africa, look at um, parts of Asia, look at the Middle East. And a wonderful thing for us to get behind ministries like we have on the screen here, Barnabas Fund, who is a church support, Voice of the Martyrs, Open Doors, some little facts and figures from Open Doors there. But it's also good for us to pray for the persecuted church our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Hebrews 13 verse 3 says this, Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. 
we can have this kind of tendency nowadays as there's different denominations and we're different parts of the world to forget that we are connected as one body. There's one body with believers, brothers and sisters in the Lord that are suffering in different parts of the world. And awesome to know that your prayers make a difference in their lives. You can pray in your prayer closet. You can pray men's, women's prayer for the persecuted church. God hears those prayers and it makes a difference in one way or another in their lives, wherever they are in the world. But also a good thing when we pray for the persecuted church, a good reminder for us as we're doing it that, hey, we're not guaranteed the way things are in our nation. There's nothing in the Bible that ever says, you know, the church in the Western world is going to be all good until Jesus comes. You don't find that there. Some will have been following uh, this past week or so, the things going on with Bethlehem College. Got another picture up on the screen, right? But pressure. They're facing a lot of pressure at the moment, aren't they? What are they going to do? We don't know, but pressure, persecution in one form or another may not be far off. Jesus said, John 16, in the world you will have tribulation. But here's a good promise, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, right? Your favourite verse. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You want to stand up for truth, you want to stand up for righteousness, holiness, God's standards, at some point along the way, you will suffer persecution the Word of God says. It's not something that we desire, not something that we look for, but also important to remember, even as with the church in Smyrna, no correction. Persecution, suffering is a mighty tool in God's hand to work on His people, purify His church. And lastly, as the team comes up, our fifth C, conqueror. To he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Jesus didn't save the Smyrnans from their suffering, but rather he strengthened them. He prepared them, gave them a heads up. And he gave them a promise. And it really is a promise full of perspective. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. You know, we sometimes think of death as the worst thing. And understand I've got no excitement about death, and I hope you don't either, right? Especially, you know, the mode of it. That doesn't excite me at all. But not that I have any ideas of how I'm going to die, but anyway, <laughs> we sometimes have this idea, don't we, that physical death is the worst thing, but it's, but it's not. Spiritual death is worse, and that's what's spoken of with the second death, is that spiritual death, eternal separation from God, the hell-bound sinner after the great white throne judgment, end of Revelation, Revelation 21, I believe destined for the lake of fire, the destination of all who do not trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. You can't forgive your own sins. You can't work to earn your salvation. It comes as a free gift from from Christ and through Him. It's the only way to be spared the judgment which is to come. And we're going to finish with some hard verses. And again, probably not verses that are on your fridge at home. But Luke chapter 12, Jesus said, and I say to you, my friends, I like that. I say to you, my friends, builds you up and then he sort of lets us down. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more power that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear, fear him. That's perspective. Heavy words and kind of a hard landing today, but it's a hard passage and some confronting things that we read in there. But this is the eternal perspective of the first and the last. Jesus who knows, Jesus who understands. And he's honest about it. 
because he knows that it's true. Man, the devil, the worst they can do is kill the body, but they've got no power over the soul. God has power over both the body and the soul. He is the one that we must fear. He is the one that we must live for and praise him that he's redeemed our sinful souls to him. There's a saying that I like, born once, die twice, born twice, die once. Not a riddle. Born once, die twice. If you're only born physically, then you will both die physically, but you will also die spiritually. Whereas if you are born twice, you will only die once, or not at all, if the Lord comes before then. If you are born physically and born again spiritually, then it's just physical death. But what follows is eternal life with Him. That's the hope of salvation that we have as, as Christians. This is the hope that we have in our Jesus who was dead and came to life. And even if there's one person here this morning, you know you're not a Christian, or maybe you're not sure if you're a Christian, that's the gospel. Jesus died for your sins, buried, resurrected unto life. Place your trust in him and do it today. And the promise, if you do, you will not be hurt by the second death. 